-hmm. Welcome. Okay, nice. Welcome. We honor each of you. We are honored by your presence. Thank you so much for your intentional time to come and speak with us about this very, very important topic that is shaping our world. It has very big ripple effects, this topic of healing trauma. And first, uh, we'll introduce ourselves and offer a brief grounding. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Bast, and my Bwiti name is Mbei, which means the river. And I study the river to better understand who I am in my essence. I am very grateful to be an initiate of the Misoko Bwiti tradition and a traditionally trained Iboga provider. And uh, and, and also having experienced uh, the Bwiti rite of passage. I am a survivor of complex PTSD. I am a survivor of trauma that left me haunted uh, for many years. The, uh, I call it the never ending flinch. Uh, and, and it was this medicine, it was this way that helped me most of all. And I'm grateful for all of the therapy. I'm grateful for even after um, really high level therapy and 20 plus years of yoga and meditation, consciousness studies, I still struggled with that uh, never ending flinch. So it was my, my background in trauma that called me to the medicine. I started learning about it for his healing crisis first and then the more I learned about it, the more the medicine called to me too for, for trauma. So I'm very grateful that I no longer live haunted and that I have all of that energy um, from the never ending flinch to utilize in other ways now. And, and very ironically, you know, I did go through the rite of passage, which is a traditional test it's a test of physical strength. It's a test of mental strength. It's a test of emotional strength. Um, and one must be really ready. One must be ready to walk into a, an experience like that. And I felt ready. And, and the experience in and of itself um, is not a trauma-informed experience, but it was the experience that liberated me the most. And, and I made a choice to walk into a space that would be challenging. Uh, and I'm grateful that I, for all the things that, that led me up to this rite of passage, and not that everyone needs to do the traditional rite of passage, but the rite of passage is very much informed by the medicine experience, which is a rite of passage on its own that we will talk about. So as a survivor of trauma and a, a traditionally trained Iboga provider now after 10 years of, of intimacy with the medicine, I also am a trauma-informed yoga teacher. I have two different certifications in two different lineages and a 30-year practice now and have also studied uh, the sutras of Shaivism. And I went through the Being True to You coaching certification for transformational coaching, which specializes in addiction recovery and psychedelic medicine integration. Uh, so, and a background in psychology as well those are the gifts I bring into the space. And along with my husband, Nima Nyangu, we are founders of this center called Soul Centro in Costa Rica. And we're very grateful to be here in the land of the Choratega. Uh, very blessed uh, to be serving this cultural heritage medicine with the blessings of our elders. Would you like to introduce yourself? Mm -hmm. My name is uh, Chor Boogie, and um, I've been working with the Masoko Asanguidia branch 
the Buiti tradition for uh, coming up to 11 years now and um, uh, work, work my way up the ladder, so to say, when it comes to uh, becoming a, a, a traditional healer on on um on uh impeccable levels you know and uh i'm considered a uh a nima an ordained nima which is one of the highest levels of 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 healer with healers within the tradition so um plus i'm an artist i've been an artist my whole life and that's me thank you Yes, and if you would like to see some of his Iboga-inspired artwork, you can go to his art website, uh, which is choreboogie.com. That's a lot of visual medicine there. I'm going to put that in the chat. So let's jump in. And again, if you, if you entered um, in the space after the beginning, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. If you have questions that come up, please save them until the end, because we want to keep the recording really private. We will be sharing the recording with others, and we would like to post it later on YouTube at a point. Uh, so if you would just save the questions until we stop the recording, and then we can have a really confidential private space to do Q&A. Okay, so welcome. We'll invite you into a brief grounding to enter into the space with a lot of intention and presence. So wherever you're at, I invite you to sit up real tall and open the heart if it feels safe to close the eyes or lower the lids, rolling the shoulders forward, up, back, and down, and taking three of the most savored cleansing breaths of your life. Breathing in that life force into every cell in the body and a brief pause at the top, another sip of air. And exhale, letting all of the thoughts, worries, tensions blow out through the exhale, through the mouth. Becoming very empty and then breathing in the fresh life force energy into every cell. Another sip of air. A brief pause and exhale through the mouth, letting go of what no longer serves, letting go through the exhale. And breathing in all that's available in this moment. Another sip of air, holding it a little longer this time. Exhale through the mouth. Releasing all that needs to be released in this moment and feeling your essence, feeling your heart, your sacred desires and intentions for being here, having a moment to honor yourself, connect to yourself, and your ancestors who live within your very body, slowly open the eyes, as if for the first time, becoming very present to your senses. Mm -hmm. Welcome. And honoring uh, the different kinds of trauma. There, there's trauma from events that happens in our life. And there is trauma that we carry from our ancestors' memories and body memories that can be, and patterns, coping mechanisms that sometimes have been honed through many, many lifetimes that no longer serve. They're like a tight coat of armor that we have outgrown. And it's very interesting. We see um, all these different kinds of trauma emerging into the work. And, and just like our, our little dog is a great case study in ancestral trauma, He's an Australian shepherd and, and they have been bred to like nip heels, like run around and nip heels. And no one ever taught him how to do that. No, he never saw another dog do that. And he has a really hard time not doing that. 
And it's been really incredible to to be training him with positive feedback and negative feedback. And it's, he still struggles with this ancient echo of this pattern that serves no purpose in his existence now. Uh, and we all carry things like that. And uh, and and sharing about you know living in trauma. What I noticed as a trauma survivor is I was always looking through the lenses of trauma. It was a filter. And I was always seeing things in terms of danger or safety and put, wanting to put it in one bucket so badly, wanting to be able to recognize what is dangerous and recognize what is safe. Um, and, and yet it's not coming from our highest functioning part of our brain when we're in trauma. So we're, we're seeing, I was seeing what I was very afraid of everywhere or seeing what I wished to see. People I wished were safe instead of who were really safe. Um, and, and looking through my own projections, desires, fears, narratives. Uh, and, and what I found through this work is it really, really limited my intimacy with the moment. I was unable to actually see clearly and be discerning from this very grounded place and when we're unable to see clearly, we create more trauma. And then we have compounded trauma. For example, choosing the wrong people in relationships. Or uh, we can't see the right choices. When we're consumed with, with fight or flight, we're really um, in, in the amygdala hijack instead of our frontal cortex, our highest functioning part of our brain which is accessed, by the way, through things like prayer. Prayer will take us right out of amygdala hijack into uh, that frontal cortex, into our, our highest discernment and awareness. And also uh, prayer and, and uh, certain kinds of practices can bring us out of fight or flight into that part of our being. And as we, as we heal trauma, and also like talking about the trauma too, like being able to reflect in the somatic awareness around where we're feeling trauma in our body can help to bring us out of being stuck in it. So as we heal trauma through this work, you can really start to see more clearly the truth about people, the truth about life around me us and we must be what I learned um, we must be in the present moment in order to best respond to it we must be fully in the present moment with our full capacity our full awareness to have all of our senses engaged and we can't do that when we're super distracted with terror of the past or attachments around the future That is the greatest safety there is, to be able to be fully present and fully seeing the truth of who people are and what's happening around us. That is the best protection. I like to say that when we're able to drop into the present moment, a thousand golden doors of opportunity open that we wouldn't have seen before for love, connection, creativity, that can only be accessed when we are deeply in the present moment with our whole body. Iboga is truly a rite of passage for our consciousness. Iboga brings us into a profound state in which we are ripe for change. This is the, you know, the ultimate neuro regenerative medicine, the ultimate neuroplasticity medicine. And that's why it's being studied now to help heal traumatic brain injury in veterans. Uh, so it brings us into this state where we are super supported to make change, but we must make the change. We must choose to actively change and it will teach us what are the changes that we do need to make. Iboga works with our own choices to let go of these patterns. And this is the scary part of the rite of passage. These, 
these coping mechanisms that are so painful that are causing us suffering these reflexes that we want so much to let go of that no longer serve us ha serve us have also helped us to survive until this moment so we're greeted with this opportunity and by the time that people get here they are so ready for change there is about a 1% that once in a while people are not ready to let go of the patterns. And that is also okay. That is their choice. They're on a different timeline that's not on the eight day retreat timeline. It's like cracking a shell. Uh, but most people, and it's really like being at the sidelines of the Olympics where people are facing themselves and choosing to release a thought pattern that isn't completely grounded in truth or isn't completely grounded in alignment with their soul, that they are ready to release that pattern. And this is where we start uh, introducing in, in a very shamanic understanding entities. An entity is a spirit and how that can be discussed in Western psychology language is a pattern that wants to replicate itself. An entity is a pattern that wants to replicate itself. And it's very interesting doing this work because you can see these things looking at you through people's eyes. You can see these things crawling up into the energy field, fighting for their lives. And then you can see when they go. And then you can see the person more. So we're going to talk about um, today principles of creating safety. This is how we create safety in the space. And we'll talk about then how medicine helps to heal trauma. And go through some of those. And, uh, and what we do if someone enters a deep trauma response. And some teachings of Iboga on trauma. And also how people can integrate trauma. There's a lot we wanna give you today. And, a, and some advice for professionals, this isn't like an immersive training for integration, but it is some really important tips if you're a professional that works with trauma who's supporting people who've specifically been through this experience. So we'll talk about all of that. Is there anything you'd like to share? Anything? Um, trauma overview? Hmm or your trauma your experience with trauma well i can share my my experience with um helping Do you think they froze or the internet cut out? Frozen on my computer. Yeah, they're frozen for me as well. And me too. Shannon is was made a host. Oh, good. Thank okay. you. Sorry, thank you for letting us know. So when it when it when it comes to uh, my experience of of helping people help themselves of healing their trauma, um, trauma is very delicate and it's 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 a very 
delicate uh, situation if they decide to go down that path or or, or make that choice of, of of healing healing that trauma, which is based off something that something from the past that they something from the past or present that they really need to let go, and it's ultimately going to be up to them if they if they really want to do that. Um, and we can honestly say that even work, it doesn't matter what plant medicine you work with, um, at the end of the day, you, you, you're not going to entirely heal, heal everything, you know, um, you, it's a work in progress. It's a work in progress when it comes to, when it comes to healing trauma and, um, Trauma is is almost like it's almost like a, a it's almost like muscle memory. It's it's a memory that's 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 uh, deeply ingrained into your mind, body, and soul that 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 needs to be released. And when Elizabeth brought up entities, um, uh, there's definitely. Uh, on a spiritual level, there's definitely a uh, a connection between between that and and the traumatic experience. So this traumatic experience may also uh, cause a disconnect within uh, your know, mind, body, and soul, depending on, on what age it has happened, and it, it'll shake your it'll sh it'll stir you up so so much it'll shake your soul from your from your body. Uh, internally, and um, not necessarily meaning that your soul is leaving you. It's it, it'll still be there, but um, uh, one of our, our main focuses and reasons of helping people with their traumas is, is helping them helping them reconnect them with their soul. I see. You know, back to their soul. And there's certain ways and processes within the Bwiti tradition that 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 we help do that. And. Um, it's very in, in, enlightening to see and uh, to see somebody reconnect back to their soul, especially after um, expressing their 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 relationship to trauma. And that is going to be one of the key factors of key key goals or key key elements of of, of internal healing is 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 speaking about the the trauma. You know, releasing, releasing um, these secrets. Some people, some people are embarrassed of their traumas. Some people um, 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 don't want to talk about their traumas. And one of the key goals, especially working with this medicine, is 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 definitely is definitely facing that trauma, and and opening the door up to that trauma, to where you can um, where you can heal it, mm -hmm. or where you can where you can get where you can get some some validation of healing and um you know speaking from from my experiences of trauma I you know um I come from a different perspective of 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 trauma you know to something something that that uh, I grew up in so I have a different demeanor when it comes to to being susceptible to pain and and knowing how to um knowing how to handle pain with tolerance. And I, I trust and know that, that my traumas had something to do with that, a, a lot to do with it. And uh, it, it, it may have um, led me down th certain aspects of, of the way I, I, I see things in life or the way I handle things in life or the way I handle pain in life. Um, way way differently than 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 the next person that that can that handles their pain and um i truly know that uh this medicine has opened up my mind body and soul to to really 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 go down that path of of my traumas to 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 heal them and um or to at least uh um fine tune them to uh to to a certain ability to where you know i i do 
I do have a, 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 a different a different understanding when it comes to that those traumas within myself, you know, but I can't speak for the next person because they have their they have their own experiences. So, you know, it's it's um it all depends on on how how much and how well you want to 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 let that trauma go and how how much how much of that trauma that you want to um reveal and heal. Mm-hmm. The more you reveal, the more you heal. Basi. Basi. Thank you. Yes, and and also what I see like coming through how you encounter trauma um is very African lineage. Oh yeah. yeah. It's very, very because because you know your ancestral roots are actually Bantu and Babongo people who hold, hold iboga. And there's a whole different culture around trauma. Plus, like, you know, the bloodline is, my bloodline is dealt with traumatic experiences yeah. from diaspora to slavery to, to even before that. So, mm-hmm. you know, we can, we can, uh, we, we can take uh, traumatic experiences to, to many different perspectives and levels. Like when it comes to even um, ancestral, uh, tra- trauma is, is even uh, tied to your ancestral bloodline. So uh, you can take it all the way back to your first ancestor, your first ancestor and, and, and um, mm-hmm. their, their, their traumatic experiences that, that they've experienced and PTSD from, from, from trying to survive uh, living in, living in the, the life and times of way back when. And that has been transferred on all the way down to each individual into your blood, blood on all the way up to you. So you, you carry those, you carry those traits. Yes. Epigenetics. We all do. Yes. And the resilience is genetic. Thank you, Nelma. There's a culture of resilience. There are prayers. There's 400 year prayers that he carries with no deadline there. And thank you, Don. Yes. Too much, too fast is, is what trauma is and living in the body, living in the body, um, uh, and I, I, with that, like a compliment to that is knowing that, you know, the wound, you know, the, the wound is the place where entities enter. Mm. So the wound, which is uh, the puncture in our field, disassociation, Western psychology calls it disassociation. And people either fully disassociate or partially disassociate in trauma when they don't have the resources, the tools, the community to help the support to make it through. Uh, And that's why I see people have memory loss. People have spotty memory because they actually weren't all the way there. Um, And in that, that portal where the soul is ejecting itself on a, in a shamanic understanding that's where entity come, comes in. And this can look like an addiction. Like, oh, hi, here's alcohol. I'll make you feel better. Or, or here's smoking pot every day. I'll make you feel better. Or here's some cocaine. I'll make you feel really mm-hmm. powerful. All the power you never had. Or you'll be, a, you know, here's the rage, the spirit of rage, which will make you feel really powerful. Um, or pe- all the things, all the addictions, the thought addictions, um, these these spirits come in and they they promise everything uh, and give us what we missed. But that wound, so the entities aren't the problem and there's no, no reason to be afraid of entities. It's just people's attachment to how the entities serve them that is really problematic. Uh, and there is this process where the wound is also the place where the medicine can enter. The bigger the wound, the bigger the space for the medicine to enter and heal. Sometimes it's the very wound that is the catalyst to bring people to this medicine. Yeah, but you know, we, we also gotta take in take in consideration the, the balanced perspective of, of 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 trauma because you know it's it's not it's not just the fact that 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 uh, traumas have been inflicted upon us. We also gotta take in consideration of 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 the traumas that we've inflicted too. Yes. Outside when, of us and to others. Basi, we say Basi a lot. <laughs> Because uh, uh, you never know what 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 um, what action you have, you have taken to uh, 
to to really inflict some trauma upon somebody, no matter what level it's on. Basi, we say basi, which is truth Lots and affirmation and agreement. And yes, everyone who's suffered trauma at some point or another inflicts trauma on others from their trauma. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of the healing process is that accountability and looking within. Uh, so when we have this disassociation, people can live habitually in some amount of disassociation, mm. like where we can see they're not all the way there. It's almost like I've seen certain people where it looks like they're wearing a mask of their own face, where they're barely tethered. Their soul is barely tethered. Uh, people feel like they have to put on a front, right? And and then through the process the, of the modalities, which we will talk about here there's an opportunity to reconnect with the soul in a very deep shamanic space to heal that relationship because it's actually a relationship with the soul. Mm. The soul is your golden compass that knows everything you need for happiness and fulfillment and safety. And when people disassociate, they can no longer have a good cell reception with the soul. So when we come back to, together with the soul, that's our guide. All of, and that's our greatest protection. And the soul allows us when we're all the way here, we can be present. Mm, Basi. Basi. So we're going to talk about principles of creating safety. So everything that we do here is based on consent. When people come, uh, they always have the right to decline more medicine uh, without any kind of force. We may explain around reasons, but people have uh, the right to decline medicine if, they're, if they choose. And uh, dialogue is with consent. Everything is with consent. Everything that we offer here. Informed consent. So we put an abundance, we always have put an abundance of information about the medicine on our website. And yet, no matter you know, we, we detail every possible common phenomenon. We, we reference a lot of research and still we can never fully predict what's going to happen in every single individual journey. So we do our very best to provide informed consent. It's part of our safety agreement that people feel that they have enough information about the medicine. And we encourage people to learn as much as they want and also you know, being guided. Some people come in and they're like, I don't want to read anything. I want to be guided by the ancestors. Fine. But it's there for people who really want to look. Um, and we do go over common phenomenon uh, when we're here in the retreat of like physical side effects of the medicine, things they may encounter so they know nothing is wrong. Uh, we offer complete transparency around what will be experienced in the retreat on multiple levels, we are co-creating safety with our guests through our safety agreement, because our guests also have important agreements such as you know, not taking contraindicated medication um, and being honest with us in their intake, things like this. We hold a very non-hierarchical space because the Bwiti is all about community, but we also practice awareness around inherent power dynamics. We had a, have a code of ethics that we hope is an inspiration to other providers. It's on our website if you want to look. Uh, we're very, very clear about sexual boundaries in our space and state that when people come in. Uh, we do appropriate screening for this medicine, which is an extremely comprehensive medical intake process with a medical questionnaire, uh, a live video chat consultation, and a full battery of tests that are appropriate for this medicine. Uh, we do have an agreement uh, for honesty. That's really, really important with our guests. And we also reiterate that when they're here and we'll explain why that's so important. Uh, we ask permission to ask direct questions. So this is really a big difference in a lot of different therapeutic styles. You don't go in with a direct question around were you sexually abused, right? Uh, often, depending on the, the container and the work. Uh, but in this space, it's very, very important that we know what traumas people have been through. And by the time that they get here, they're really ready to be open. And we discuss all of this, that this is very important that we ask direct questions and that there's space to be uncomfortable. There's space um, for that to happen. And we really presence the difference between comfort and safety. And to really look at uh, what, what is real safety and what is discomfort and examine that. 
Uh, and we, we do ask people, this is very important, to put down other modalities and traditions. Sometimes people can be very immersed in other modalities and traditions, and it may not only be inappropriate here or inappropriate with this tradition that we honor and hold a lineage of, but it can even cause harm. And we'll explain some of that as well. This is a very unique medicine. It's a very unique function with trauma. And I think you, you might be uh, pretty blown away at some of the things that can happen that we will explain. Uh, and, and also what's really cool is that most of our guests that come here are from word of mouth and referral. And, and I notice that when people come in through relationships, uh, or building relationships with us in advance, that they go deeper when they're here. You know, the medicine is only as good as the uh, community relationships that hold it. That's why it's held in tribes. It's so important. So it's a very, very relational medicine. Uh, sometimes people think like, oh, I can do it on my own. I'm a psychonaut. I've done all the medicines. And this is not that. You know, this is like a person giving birth needs a helper. A person giving birth may need a reminder to breathe at a certain point who has expertise in the process. And this is not a DIY medicine. And we encourage that as from a safety point of view, please don't ever do this on your own. Please, uh, if you hear about people trying to do it on their own, please you know, encourage them not to. It can get very, very, very dangerous. Uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and also a lot of the medicine people will find online is adulterated, or we just had someone make another report that they tried to get it online and ended up with diarrhea and sick, and that's being lucky, you know, so we want to say, please don't ever, it's also a cultural heritage medicine with sustainability issues. Um, so we are trauma informed here. I have deep studies in trauma and also uh, and there's many aspects of trauma-informed care that we have present here. And trauma-informed spaces are vital, vital for people beginning to heal and having safe spaces where they can, they can have boundaries and they can control where they're at in their process. And this medicine, in the way that it's, it's unique, um, you know, the Bwiti are very intimate with this medicine. They've been in devotional reciprocal relationship with this medicine for eons. And if we look at, so their teachers, the Babongo people who are known by the colonial term of the pygmies held the medicine first and taught them. So we've been working with fire for 1.7 million years and probably having ceremony just as long or almost that long. It's possible that human beings and our ancestors have been working with this medicine for millions of years. And I see there's that level of intimacy that has been passed down to us to help people with this process. Whereas Western psychology is 200 years old and, and not familiar with Iboga. So it's very important when people come into this space to be willing to have a beginner's mind. And uh, there's this Zen uh, quote from a Zen master on, on our blog we're about to put up around preparing for the medicine that there's many possibilities in the beginner's mind and few in the experts. So it's very important to come into this new experience. So how does the medicine heal trauma? One of the first things is the purge. And there's a physical purge, like, you know, we think of purging into a bucket. Uh, and then there's the mental purge and, and the mind purge is unlike any other medicine where it's an onslaught, very rapid as it presents for most people, a very rapid onslaught of all everything in the psyche that's either really been experienced or imagined or seen uh, or thought about, even reading a news article. So this purge will come up and it can appear as very scattered and nonsensical and people don't understand the meaning right away. That's why we try to talk about it. And then uh, a part of the purge function is amplification. So whatever the neurosis is, it will become louder. And why would the medicine do that? You know, it will become vivid, it would become louder. It's so that we can study and fully see 
what is happening, how we've how we've been using our mind, what's been in our mind. We can only be able to be ready to let go of psychic material when we fully know what it is. For example, when you go to clean out your basement and you have all these boxes, you don't just give all the boxes to Goodwill. You have to go through every box and see what's in it. There might be some family heirlooms that you wanna keep. And like, oh, that's a treasure, but a lot of shit you wanna let go of. So it's the same thing happening with the mind and the medicine will continue to turn up the volume on the neurosis until someone makes a choice to change how they're using their mind. For example, a lot of people who have been through trauma and who have been abused by another person will do one of two things. Like Resma Menachem is an amazing um, uh, black therapist who talks about white body supremacy trauma. And he talks about clean pain and dirty pain. So when someone abuses us, uh, dirty pain is taking it out on somebody or taking it out on ourselves. Clean pain is conscious processing. So taking it out on ourselves, like a lot of people become their own abuser in their mind because truly we are not what somebody did to us. We are what we continue to do to ourselves when that person is no longer there, when that event is no longer there. And that is really, 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 really deep, intense accountability. And not to say that there shouldn't be justice, you know, but to really look at how have I become my own abuser in my mind. And so if those self-abusive thoughts will come up that actually are not grounded 100% in truth, like, for example, uh, you know, someone who says something really self-deprecating, that's, it's not actually 100% true. The medicine is trying to bring it up to bring it out. And it must come up to be seen to come out. So it'll keep turning it up until someone's like, okay, I'm willing to stop that. And it can be a real hard time if someone doesn't want to stop that until they are really, really ready. Uh, but it's a beautiful process, actually. Like the medicine pushes us. Um, and there's a deep inner excavation with this mind purge of what's really in our psyche. This is, like Nyangu says, spiritual archaeology, looking at everything. The medicine is very confrontational. There's no space for someone to say, I want to take a break. The medicine will bring it up and put it right in our face. It'll put our fears in our face. It'll put the trauma in our face. And the purpose of that is that it gives us an opportunity to digest all that was undigested when our soul was ejected in disassociation, where we can finally be present within the safe space of the ceremony, within the spiritual protection that Nyangu holds from the lineage that they can face and digest and I help also help people a lot with midwifing to like breathe through certain visualizations that are completely channeled from the medicine to move through. It's very often that people go into regression in this process. They can even have memories of being in utero. Iboga really touches the nerve of trauma in this process. Everything is activated. And that's why it's so important, like, you know, Don. And we had this conversation the other day, if people are not really in a safe space and they can, like the truth is that they're in a, an unsafe space, this process is very, very, very problematic. Uh, but within a safe space, it's very profound. There's also a deep physical purge of biochemical toxins. With every thought we're making biochemical medicine such as oxytocin or dopamine or stress hormones that are degenerative and toxic and sometimes people are saturating themselves in stress hormones for years and there's this big 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 deep deep purge there's the deepest purges of any medicine i've ever seen or experienced myself i've experienced all of the other big medicines and this is the deepest physical detox that's why it can take people off of opioids in 24 hours a really deep detox so there's a physical clarity that allows people to be supported in healing and change and then there is the journey at the right time in the and when the weather conditions are right in their journey 
or in their experience, we can offer them a, a journey to connect with their soul. And there's a soul connection that can happen here. There's healing of ancestors that can happen here. There's deep mind repatterning that can happen here. Uh, and visualizations, as anyone knows who studies trauma, that visualization is our, our, our psyche doesn't know the difference between visualization and what is real. Uh, so that there's visualizations that can happen that through the visions that are very helpful. And like Resma Minicum says, completing the action. So there's something, for example, being attacked when someone couldn't couldn't vocalize anything or couldn't confront their abuser that on a soul level, and this is what we see is actually happening, is that somebody's soul can confront the soul of the abuser and, and say what they need to say, you know, can banish them, can, uh, you know, there's very shaman, various shamanic things that they can be um, moved away out of their field. And also forgiveness can happen here. And in this space is highly, highly neuroplastic. So it's not an ordinary visualization. And what we understand is someone is actually in a realm and not a hallucination. It's a spirit world, which we have lots of experiences that have that evidence um, to for you to discover. You want to talk about the journey at all? Anything you want to add? Yeah, one of the um, the greatest foundations of uh going down the path of of trauma and healing trauma i would have to say is is um especially when it comes to healing the uh, uh, the mind body and soul is 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 going down the path of uh forgiveness that is one of the the greatest healers of 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 healing trauma i see you know whether 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 it was inflicted or or you've inflicted it, it's it's going down that path of of forgiveness. And from my experience of taking people down that path, uh, the the forgiveness part is is key. It's key to survival. It's a key to healing. It's a key to to um to all aspects of healing. Healing healing um every individual that is is a part of uh, part of the equation um depending on the situation depending on the situation and depending on 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 what has happened you know there are there are cases where some some forgiveness is 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 can be a part of the equation but but there 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 needs to be some some type of um resolution there needs to be some type of 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 um consequence that that uh that can happen spiritually to to uh, the ones who have have inflicted that pain and um reason being is because uh depending on the situation sometimes those people do not do not uh deserve uh they do not deserve their they do not deserve that forgiveness some some people don't and um but it, but it is inclined for that individual to uh to to forgive um mm -hmm. If if they're up for it, if not, then then there's other there's other pathways to 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 heal that situation. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. There's also nervous system healing. So as we talked about the the neuroregenerative neuroplasticity effects, uh, this is a powerful nervous system healing medicine. And what's interesting is that you know, at first it can feel very uncomfortable as if all our nerves are on fire or all our nerves are plugged into a socket and everything is activated. And that's why we, we tremble. There's ataxia with the medicine, with this trembling. I've also seen someone go into a full vagal response, which is really interesting. Uh, and, and it's like a cleansing. And then this medicine also is, a, it has a special aftermath you know, this medicine that I feel is the ultimate medicine for peace and bliss. Uh, after someone's nervous system has been, it's cleansed uh, energetically, 
from and also from the patterns, but also fortified, it helps us to actually have the capacity to feel more, to perceive more in our life. And, and we need all the other pieces to do that, like being able to be present. Um, so we've also seen like really interesting responses, like a, like a tingling around old injury sites. Uh, as the nerves are being healed, uh, we have seen one gentleman who's been with us three times on retreats and Africa twice, he had his tinnitus disappear after his third uh, retreat. So that's a nerve issue. So it's really fascinating the, poss the possibilities for healing nerve damage. So some of the effects that people don't know a lot about that I'm really excited to talk about and share this with you is the function of auditory hallucinations. This is a fascinating effect of the medicine and about 60, 70% of people will have very vivid auditory hallucinations. Uh, partial, like uh, there's full auditory hallucinations where we hear about things that were said like when I'm not even in the room, like a blatant auditory hallucination and then a partial auditory hallucination where people um, is a spin off of something that was said. Ah, interesting. Yeah, and and why would this happen? You know that the, there's a very intelligent function of the auditory hallucinations, and we tell people about this in advance. Like when we first did iboga, nobody told us this might happen. You know, but we we tell people this might happen, and if anything comes up that they hear that's troubling to please have an agreement to speak with us about it, because uh, especially if it's troubling. And, and what this does is it reveals exactly the core wounds, exactly. And then it reveals to the facilitators what's needed to heal those core wounds. It's like, a, it, it, it's like an X-ray. And for example, there was a woman at one of our retreats, uh, and I'm just sharing enough that it's still quite anonymous here. Um, she was completely convinced that me and another facilitator were outside of her door talking about her body and her clothing and kind of gossiping about her. And she was so convinced it was very hard to convince her that we weren't doing that for about half of the day. She was very, very suspicious, but she came there suffering from body image issues, right? So there it is. And, and we had a guest who was convinced that Chor and I were having an argument that was seemed like hours long and that, it, and that we were fighting and that I was going to leave. And he had a whole fantasy. Um, and then he was willing to talk with us about it. And I said, no, there was, there was peaceful morning. There was no fighting, you know, not that we don't have intense discussions sometimes, but that, that was a very like peaceful morning. And my first question to him was, did your parents fight? Yes, all the time. And you know how terrifying that is for a little person. It's like trying to have your home on the ground of earthquake ground, right? And so we became the target of that narrative because what trauma does is it wants to find the target. Okay, this thing outside of me is what's dangerous. These, these are the people that are dangerous. And so what happens when the medicine, the medicine is the truth. And the truth allowed him to look within himself. When I said, no, we weren't fighting to please, you know, look within about how that affected you, how you absorbed those patterns, how you can find unconditional safety within that. And we had a process around that. Um, there was another person who had suffered really bad sexual trauma, grew up in a bad neighborhood, and was convinced that there were people outside the door that were planning to do terrible things. And they, and but because we had informed them, they realized they were having a delusion and was able to um, make it through the night and speak with me about it and be okay. Um, another, another, here's another example. These are all like really fascinating examples where I was taught have partial auditory hallucination where I was talking, consulting with someone who wasn't honest with us on their, on their intake. Um, 
and was, oh, I forgot. I forgot I took um, some contraindicated illicit substances. I forgot. And, and I had said, I see patterns of addiction. And they thought I had called them an addict, which I don't wor use that word. I haven't, I've eliminated that from my, my vocabulary since a decade ago, studying back Gabor Mate. I don't say that word, but they felt very, very shamed. And we were able to have a process where I said, I didn't say that word, but what's important is the shame that's coming up. That's really important and giving all the permission and the safety. Let's go into the shame. Let's look at the shame there. And, you know, someone may perceive that initially, right, as like gaslighting. Like if I said, I didn't say that, but actually I didn't say that. And she was able to have a really deep process. This person also had a, um, a partial auditory hallucination that in the fire talk, uh, Chor had said, this is the only right way. Like the Buiti is the only right way. And that's something that we never, ever, ever say as a rule, like as a policy. Um, you know, the, the Buiti is a very open tradition that respects other traditions. But, and they thought that he had said that, but, but we said, oh, let's look at that because there was religious trauma. See how there's like clues and when people are, are in agreements to be honest with us, then we can really help the healing. Uh, and it's really fascinating. Uh, people imagine other people talking in ceremony all the time and saying things. So um, also one time a guest, and this, this is where it gets really, really, really tricky. There was a guest that had, had, had been bullied, had had really, um, it was a man who had deep, trauma with the masculine and what happens so what happens is that when this is a truth truth serum this medicine is the most powerful truth serum it will make things come out one way or another either people can be honest about it or found out about it and he, if people don't talk about the, what they're going through, the fantasy can get bigger. It, can, it will just keep getting bigger and bigger until it comes out and it can lead people into um, unsafe spaces. Uh, for example, there was a man in the ceremony that was convinced there were people outside of the temple that were heckling him. He thought there was a man with a gun and his dad was from the military, right? And had some of that trauma, that energy. And what, what we see also, these are spirits that can't, you know, they're being cast out. Um, and, and we had, he was able to be honest with us that there were, he thought there were people outside. So we could say, no, there's no one outside. You're okay. Um, but that could have been very unsafe if he wasn't willing to talk about it with us. See? And there was this other man I mentioned who had trauma with the masculine that became convinced Chor was um, a gangster who might put a hit out on him. And so there was this fantasy. And, and then we start to see even things like unconscious bias, right? And stereotypes and things that are tied into it. So it, he finally, it, the medicine pushed him and pushed him and pushed him until he was able to be honest. And then we could help him work through that and help him work through some very, very deep material. But the most important thing is the honesty. And in a lot of therapeutic containers, there it's like, okay, talk about it when you're ready, right? Which is really important. In this space, it can start to get unsafe if people don't talk about it. And still it's their choice. Still it's their choice that we must respect but we do our very best to create the container and the safety on the way in to say, please be honest with us about what you are thinking, what you are experiencing. And it's also really interesting too, like when these projections, because auditory hallucinations are a form of projection. When these projections start to come up, we the, one of the first things we say in the fire talk is if people find themselves dwelling more of the time on how somebody else should change or somebody else's issues, 
uh, we prompt them to turn inward and see where that lives inside. That said, sometimes there's very real feedback that's very legitimate, you know, and that's that's a different thing. But but to notice if people are kind of like obsessing about how somebody else in the circle should be different or some how somebody else has issues to heal instead, like bringing the focus back here. So what happens? Is there anything you want to add before I? OK, uh, what happens with Iboga is people are entering into labor like a person giving birth. Labor is a deadline. Labor is a serious ceremonial container, right? You know, I, I, some of us have actually given birth and know that it's this like charged, rhythmic, it has a momentum and we're giving birth to ourselves with this medicine. And so if you go into labor and you don't push, people can get stuck in their patterns because all the neuroplasticity can go for good things or harmful things. So people have a choice. And what is it that helps people to push? Is seeing the truth. It is studying the truth. And we will help people. Uh, and, and again, like Nyangu says, is very delicate. Offering the truth of what we observe. <clears throat> so we will offer the truth of what we observe, like very, very clear, grounded, factual observations or truth that they have revealed to us. Uh, and also encouraging them to hunt the truth for themselves. Hunt the truth for themselves, right? Like if they're having a projection about somebody, if they're having a projection about somebody, to look at, oh, well, what's your reason for thinking that, you know? And sometimes we'll be like, oh, I, I, I don't know. You know, if they have a judgment about somebody else in the circle, it's like, well, what's your reason for assuming that someone is a certain way um, if they haven't had auditory hallucinations? And, and often I hear, oh, I, I don't know. And that's really interesting. You know, that's really curious. So really inviting people and often through questions, you know, well, how did you come to this conclusion about this repetitive thought or that repetitive thought or getting to the root, getting to the root of the truth will help people to, to move through and see clearly. And we must ask direct questions in the space. It's very important. And because iboga is a very direct medicine. So the, the process of the council is aligned with the medicine. Um, and it's really beautiful when, when people give us consent to ask direct questions and they're ready to, to, uh, to start peeling away the scales, you know, peeling away the armor. And, and here's this piece, piece where, you know, people have to feel safe, to be honest. And what's interesting about this medicine is that the experience of iboga leads people to um, trauma response spaces that inherently feel unsafe, that it inherently can feel unsafe when the medicine is helping people to purge these chronic lifelong proverbial feelings of being unsafe. And, and people need to be willing to um, agree to be honest even through that discomfort. And there's a beautiful process of, of helping people to tune into an unconditional safety, to be a safe space within themselves, for themselves first. And that allows people to drop out of fight or flight and create that for themselves. So they're no longer operating from the amygdala hijack. And a lot of people don't know how to be a safe space for themselves. They're always looking for other people to make a safe space for them. And that, this is one of the most profound pieces of this work is people can learn how to be a safe space for themselves. Um, and and we, we really must speak the truth of what we see. Like, for example, um, there was one guest who on discovery day, the day after ceremony, when we uh, we, we ask people not to be on their devices and not to communicate with the outside world. It's a very, very delicate 24 hours of 
psychospiritual surgery and neurological upgrade, she went into this deeply triggered space of wanting to call her partner because she also had had told me she's in codependent patterns with her partner and uh, and and really um, not finding her own power within that. But in that moment, when she was deep in that trigger, part of reflecting the truth to her was saying, remember when we talked before you came that you made a conscious choice not to come here with that person. You made a conscious choice to have your own journey. And now it's time for your own journey. And that completely shifted that trigger for her. And she was able to enter into finding her own strength. So that's one example of like sharing the truth with someone. It's also really interesting, like the different kinds of people can be triggered. People can have projections in the different ways. Um, for example, you know, one, one guest uh, that had been really harmed and violated by um, the strong masculine and sure reminded him of that person. Um, and then like me, my voice really triggered one guest because it reminded them of their mother who was abusive and problematic. Um, and, and, and another person who, um, who had, who had, um, uh, offered some feedback that like, you know, the, the, you know, that that big masculine energy was, was really, um, uh, felt threatening, like Chor is a very masculine being and, and the Buiti is a very, you know, a tradition that celebrates masculinity in a really healthy way and fully expressing ourselves and fully, full, full embodiment of ourselves. And so when I asked, well, did anything happen? Did anything happen that uh, caused you to feel unsafe? Did they do anything? And they said, no, they couldn't identify anything. They couldn't identify anything. And I, and, and we can't ask someone to change who they are to make the trauma response more comfortable, right? So we have these beautiful opportunities in all these cases that someone goes through a process with us and they stop seeing their through their filter and start seeing who's actually in front of them. And, and it's so profound to like watch the entities leave their eyes and they can finally like see who we are. And um, these people are doing great, you know, at this point. Um, so those, these are just some of the examples. Um, also, for example, like someone who's been really shamed by a caregiver and often like we will be the projection screens for the traumas around the, the caregivers or pre-verbal trauma for a time sometimes, unless someone has a lot of skill in identifying what's coming from inside of themselves first. Uh, some people really come in with a lot of skill set first, but we're, we're able to midwife people through it. And, and sometimes people can have the hardest day of their life the day after ceremony. They can have guilt coming up. They can have shame coming up. They can have regret. They can have anger. They can have all of the feelings that they haven't fully felt. The medicine brings up everything that hasn't been fully felt. Uh, and so when these things come up in the, in the event that it becomes about us, we're able to then direct it to what's really, really important is what you're feeling and not dismissing what they're feeling, that what you're feeling is really, really important and they're able to move through. Uh, is there anything you want to add? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if someone enters, we have a few more pieces and we'll move into Q&A after that. And we'll have a little bio break too. If someone enters into a deep trauma response, so this is where it gets really, really tricky. Like um, the person that I mentioned that had a fantasy that um, Tor was a gangster that might put a hit out on him. He held that inside for a while as it got bigger. And, and we can only invite people to talk, you know? And, and I see that some of the trauma responses can come up, like a freeze response. 
a fawn response, um, fight or flight, um, is actually less common than freeze or fawn. And so he was really in freeze and in fawn. Um, and that's their choice to talk to us. And that's where it's the rite of passage that they wanna, when they wanna really engage and face it and talk with us, it's the relational medicine, they must choose and we can't force, you know, and we don't have permission to help people through any process until they open up. Like Tor says, you heal what you reveal. And once people open up, they move through. And he was eventually able to move through that uh, but we only have permission when people engage and are honest with us about what they're going through. Um, and, and they can um, occasionally just get more and more and more irritated until they're able to open up and then it moves. Um, and I share anything. Um, Iboga has taught me some things about trauma uh, that come from my direct experience. And maybe it's echoed in a book out there somewhere, but these are uh, really direct from the medicine. Uh, and one thing I wanna share with fellow people out there, you know, who are suffering from trauma, from that unending flinch, from that exhausting, heavy armor, uh, from these patterns, from being haunted, right? So these trauma responses, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. These are not patterns to altogether abandon. And we never can. These are ancient, ancient, intelligent patterns of survival. They're powerful and they're actually a source of power. They're a source of power. And if we just try to crush, 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 or get them to stop, they will never stop. They'll probably be more persistent. What we can do is train like soldiers. And I don't mean soldiers like in a war, I mean S-O-U-L, soldiers, where let's, let's have a conscious training ground for fight that that could look like studying martial arts, right? Train fight. Uh, what about flight? That's someone who maybe becomes a marathon runner. Train flight. Freeze. Meditation and stillness. Train freeze. Uh, fawn. This could look like theater training. See? Where we enter into these and find their power and express them consciously. And when we exhaust them and express them consciously, they are less likely to haunt us because we are in our full power with them. Uh, so really training them. And Iboga said to me, the only way to heal an impulse is to make a new impulse. So being an active training around what is the new impulse that we need to have when in that trigger? What is the new impulse? What is the mantra, the practice, the safe word? Tor talks about safe words. Uh, and really embracing all emotions as sacred guests and coming into relationship with our anger, into relationship with our fear, not trying to crush anger, not trying to crush fear, not trying to crush jealousy, not trying to crush sadness, but to come into relationship and find the call to action in every emotion. Do you want to talk about um, being in relationship? Well, emotions? I'll bring up something when it comes to Iboga and trauma and healing and, and, and going down the path of healing, healing trauma with Iboga. Um, uh, traumas are traumatic experiences. So um, it's almost like you have to take, uh, you, 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 when, it, when it comes to uh, scientific models and, and medical models of of curing viruses or something. Let's use that for an example. Curing a curing a virus. It's almost it's almost like taking you have to you have to you have to take uh, some of that virus in order in order to 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 create some type of um um vaccine for that virus to to heal that virus. 
So the, this, this is kind of the same scenario with trauma. It's almost taking a, 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 your traumatic experience and, and, and healing it with, with a positive traumatic experience. Uh, hence Iboga, because uh, Iboga is, is, is not easy. Iboga is not easy. It's not magic pill. It's not, it's, 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 it's going to, it's going to bring everything up from, from the bottom up to the surface and, and you're going to have to face it. So you're going to take that, that, and, and, and sometimes that's, that's, that's a, a traumatic experience for people. But you 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 you're under the impression of the med of the medicine. So you're gonna you're gonna take advantage of that situation, take advantage of that situation of being with the medicine, and and fighting fire with fire. Okay, that's 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 gonna that's gonna help you give give you help give you a better grasp of 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 how to how to face your trauma and how to heal trauma. Fighting fire with fire. And um. Um, and Iboga is that fire. I see. If 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 this if this is calling you to go down that path of 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 of, of uh, a spiritual healing, a, a mental, physical, and spiritual healing, uh, these these are the tools that 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 uh, you you will have to prepare yourself for when it comes to working with this medicine. And this medicine is going to help you do that. Fight fire with fire. So um, uh, some people are not ready for that. Uh, some people, even when they even when they're under the experience and they go through the experience, they're, they're like, oh, that, that was brutal. One of the most brutal experiences they had in their lives. But at the end of the day, uh, the outcome is 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 beautiful it's because they they ended up they ended up fighting fire with fire and going going through that experience and 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 healing it. Through whatever means of of whatever means it takes to heal it, uh, with the medicine, and and the the journey process and and the navigational process that we help we we help we help guide you through that. You're not going in it alone. You can't go in it alone. Mm -hmm. You can't deal with this medicine alone because it it is just it, it's 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 not it. safe. It's not safe like that. Simply because you know the spirit world is 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 nothing nothing to be meddled with and nothing to be nothing. It's, it needs to be taken seriously, and it's 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 not a place. It's not a place where you think you know what you think you know. It is it is a it is a jungle. It is a serious place. It is it is a real place. It's a fun place, but it's also a dark place. And um, this place, this place, you need navigation through. You need the proper and 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 the right protections to go through to go through and do this. Even when it comes to facing your traumas, you need the proper and right protections to do that. And that's and that's and that's what uh, we have been given here at Soul Central. If you go, if you if 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 nobody is is talking, saying what I'm saying about about healing and 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 protections and uh certain aspects of, of the tradition then it's not real and, and 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 that's how real i am with you with anybody and everybody that comes to uh do this medicine if they if they are serious about healing their traumas and healing themselves mm -hmm. there's this is this is it's not easy work mm -hmm. for you or me or us yeah it is not because um because it's 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 a war. It's an internal war. It's 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 greater than all physical wars. I see. Men and women. So it, it doesn't matter as long as you as long as you come through the other end, um, understanding, overstanding, and understanding who you really are. I see. And 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 trusting yourself in order to look. On who you really are, and really going down that path of of self discovery, Be, like Elizabeth said, like I say, becoming a spiritual archaeologist, I see. a true spiritual archaeologist for the rest of your life from here on out, uh, being being um, being a reborn, um, unlearning to relearn um, the truth about your mind, body, and soul. Once you learn that, then everything everything on the external will will come to you. It's just, it's just the way this thing, this is the way this thing operates. 
That's just the way this goes. Thank you. Basi. Basi. Thank you. Yes. It's really interesting, like how many people will go through Basi truth? How many people will go through, a, you know, a couple medicine ceremonies and feel entitled, you know, to take yeah. uh, and buy medicine and serve others? Um, right. So it's not real. It's just, yeah. That stuff is just not real. Yeah. They're, much they're, respect. They're, they're, for not the talking, Buiti. they're not telling you stuff like this. It's not real. And much respect to the Buiti for the ancestral knowledge. Um, so, uh, some some uh, elements of integration, and just a few things, and we're, we're almost to Q&A. Uh, one thing that is really important is ritual. Coming out of this experience, people may need to have a grief ritual, uh, and we talk about grief rituals here. The medicine really teaches us a lot about the art of grief, which must be an art, you know, if people try to avoid grief, it becomes more persistent. So we go into grief rituals, and they can be communal rituals, solo rituals. Uh, and, and that's one of my favorite things to help people with is all, all of these uh, rituals of letting go. And we do some rituals here around letting go too with fire and water. Um, and, and I want to presence the rite of passage culture that is the Buiti. And what's really fascinating, what's re what's really fascinating is, you know, rite of passage is a test that I talked about a little bit earlier. And by the way, if you jumped in late, please watch the recording that'll be sent out. So in the rite of passage, we go into it like, okay, this is a test. I'm ready. What's possible is that we can look at life like a rite of passage that everything that happens to us becomes food for medicine. We can take the suffering that we have experienced, which doesn't mean excusing it, which doesn't mean bypassing it. You know, we can take all of the suffering and make medicine out of that suffering, make teachings out of that suffering, make art out of that suffering until our scar tissue becomes our jewelry. So we have alchemizing, basi, we can look at life as rite of passage when you're ready. Because one of the most disempowering things that I, myself included, for many years of being haunted by trauma, would ask, why me? And this narrative creates biochemical toxins in our body. Why me? Why me? We'll never know why me. There's no reason. We make a reason. So I make a reason for everything that happened to me. And it's a very different approach and orientation to the trauma when somebody is ready. It's not to be rushed. There's the phases of grief, which are really important. It's important to have the rage. It's important to have these questions, but not to get stuck there for a decade of disempowerment, where we can be a survivor. Um, and I really respect the, the rite of passage culture in that way. It's a beautiful, beautiful culture of strength. See. Basi. Basi. And what was I going to say? Uh. Another foundation of um, of of the healing aspects of trauma is um, is that we we also have to take in consideration of 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 listening. So no matter what path you want to go down no matter what road you want to take what medicine you want to take um or whatever therapist or, or whoever you 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 want to you want to um receive gifts from healings from uh at the end of the day no matter what uh it, it's going to boil down to, to listening and listening to um Listening to the gifts they haven't given me, given you, especially coming and doing this medicine, you know, uh, going down, going down that 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 aspect of of listening and and truly listening and hearing what the medicine is giving you, uh, it, which is the main focal point, which which is the main point of of the reason why you came to do this medicine, is to listen to it. See, and 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 we we definitely have a percentage, or you know. 
maybe one percent of, of people that, that actually you know do not listen mm -hmm. and and they wonder why why nothing's happening or nothing's working because they didn't listen they're not listening to the medicine you know i don't care how much money you want to spend on 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 whatever um at the end of the day it's going to be it's going to boil down to 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 listening and and listening listening to the, the gifts that we're giving you when it comes to when it comes to um especially working with this medicine and the and 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 the gifts that were given to you uh through the tradition walking through these doors no basi basi thank you listen listen implement practice mm -hmm. you know pra we encourage people Every to day practice is training day practice their answers that they receive from the medicine every day and then here's, you know, this question too, of like, how, how do we help heal traumas such as racialized trauma or gender-based and sexual trauma, uh, trauma of late stage capitalism, classism, how do we heal these traumas that are still going on, right? They're still happening. And again, this relates to training the trauma responses that I talked about. Training them is really therapeutic and also listening to the soul call to action. I call it a soul call to action, where this might mean social justice work, but for other people who you know, have ancestral patterns of self-sacrifice self and overworking and poverty consciousness, maybe it's revolutionary for them to embrace self-care and slowing down and sacred pleasure and abundance and beauty. Um, and listening, listening to the soul, and the soul call to action. Uh, there, there may be an article to write. There may be a talk to give. There may be just a conversation with someone to have of sharing your story with someone. Um, the, these kinds of things like that still go on in the world, there's a soul call to action. And this is really therapeutic for the soul to be able to do one thing uh, about that trauma. And we can't do everything. Like this is where you get a lot of burnout in social justice warriors that they can overdo and overdo and spread themselves so, so thin, which is also a way to avoid oneself. Uh, they're trying to heal everything and fix every, everything to the point where they destroy themselves. And what the medicine shared with me is that we, we can't do one thing about every problem in the world, but we can help every problem in the world by doing one thing with our full presence. So there's a call to action. Like if someone suffered um, sexual trauma and that's still happening in the world uh, to ha listen for their call to action. What's something they can do that's, that's really nourishing for them? And yes, um, Iboga itself is not the modality. You are the modality. Iboga is the divine rocket fuel and you must drive the ship. And that's because Iboga is not here to control human beings. It's not the magic happy pill. It is an opportunity to learn and grow. Iboga is here for our maturation of consciousness, and it's only by freedom of choice to evolve that that can happen. So we have just a little bit of uh, offerings for people who are helping professionals. Uh, and if so, all, after all that you've heard, you know, if you have someone come through this experience, you know, you have a better understanding of the process and how provocative it is and what kinds of things can come up. And also people can still be experiencing the most subtle kind of tail ends of purge after they leave. We also presence this with our guests that you may have another little wave of something that's leaving you. It, it doesn't end on day eight on our clock. You know, I, Iboga is, stays in the body for a long time. Our doctor says the metabolites can stay with them people for months, months, and still working on them, bringing things up to be examined and released. So knowing that someone could still be in a psychological purge, knowing that someone may have had auditory hallucinations, and to help people hunt the truth. Uh, and people have had may, may have had projections and really invite them to look at the truth, to hunt the truth, inquire um, around their experience and ask if they talked about what they went through. 
you know, ask if they were honest about what they went through um, and inquiring about the whatever happened. We may never know unless you're in direct touch with their uh, with the facilitators, but to inquire about the true source of their feelings, regardless, you know, that it is whatever is coming up is really, really valuable material. And that is what to focus on. Um, and, and of course, that said, um, sometimes <clears throat> things come up that are not a, a auditory hallucination or projection, and those things are important too. But to be aware that these are some of the things that can happen. And <clears throat> when people are in trauma response here, we give them a lot of space. We don't take things personally. We don't react. You know, we just kind of keep bringing them the food and honoring their boundaries and checking in and, and hopefully they become ready to speak to us. Um, and usually they do, you know, it's really, really beautiful. Um, and, and sometimes there's just, uh, people are really ready to jump in by the time that they get here. Uh, we form relationships before they get here. And also, you know, when people have feedback, People need to have a safe space to give feedback too. And we really consider all feedback as important information to look at. Um, uh, and uh, I just wanna mention before I stop the recording and take some Q and A and have a little bio break that anyone on this call uh, can mention this call, mention this webinar um, to receive a $500 off discount of any retreat that's booked within 30 days of this date. And you just write in at info at Soul Centro and let us know. It's not applicable, for example, with another kind of discount, like a partial scholarship um, uh, or, or someone who is has been registered from a time ago, but uh, you're welcome to request that and we'll make sure that you get it. Anything else you wanna add for the recording? Mm. Okay. I'll stop our recording. Thank you so much for, for joining us here.